Well, good morning to all of you. Good morning to Bethel Church. Uh, this morning, we are going to gather together as Bethel Church in, in a different way than usual. Um, and I'm so glad we can do this. Now, today, we're, we're gathering together as Bethel Church in our own homes. Uh, wherever you are this morning, uh, we're going to gather together as one body through Jesus Christ. Uh, together, we can turn to the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we can ask God to unite us together as his people and as his church. And I am so glad we can do this. <clears throat> you know, Pastor Chris, he has been, he's been working really hard on, on the technology that we need uh, for us to do it this way. And uh, he, he's actually tracked down the latest technology, the, the most sophisticated technology that we could get our hands on in order to do this. So, so now you can see me this morning from your own homes. And uh, with the technology we have now, I, I can actually still see you. And that's great. I can see you. I can tell if you come to church wearing your pajamas this morning or if you got dressed or if you have a cup of coffee in your hands. In fact, right now, I can see that Ryan Taylor and Travis Taylor, they're wearing their matching John Deere tractor pajamas. And uh, I can see them. They look really cute, actually. I'm just joking. I can't see you at all, <laughs> but I'm glad you can see me. Um, well, I want to pray in a moment, and then we're going to look at God's Word together. But before I pray, I just want to mention a few things. First of all, I hope you were able to get your hands and, and kind of find your way through uh, some worship songs for this morning, that you were able to just enjoy some songs that our worship leaders chose, and we're able to follow the instructions for that. Um, we are doing this today. We're going to keep doing it this way because uh, we want to stay connected as a church. Um, I hope that you're still praying for each other. I hope that you're still reaching out to each other and calling each other and talking to each other. Uh, please continue to do that. We need to keep doing that. And I hope you are doing that. Some of you have asked me, how long are we going to be doing it this way? And I just need to let you know, I don't know. I don't know how long we're going to be doing it this way. Uh, when we met together last Sunday, we didn't realize how quickly things were going to change even that day, uh, that that would probably be our last time meeting together in this building for a while. Uh, we're not sure how long this will last, but I, I do want you to know that as, as a church, we're going to keep finding ways to, to grow in our faith, to do that together. We, we're going to pray for one another, and, and we're going to share God's love with others around us. That's part of our vision as a church, is to find ways to serve others with the love of God. Uh, that's not going to stop, even if we can't gather together on Sunday mornings like we're used to. So even if you're in your home right now, uh, if, there's, if you're with your family or your spouse, or even if you're on your own, I'm going to invite you to just bow your heads with me, and we're going to pray. And let's just pray and commit this morning in our, our church service to God today. So let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we can gather in this way. That, Lord, uh, you, you see us as Bethel Church. Wherever we are in the ways that we're spread out, uh, we can still meet with you this morning together. And we want to lift you up. We want to commit this time to you. We ask that, Lord, the things that you'd want to say to us, the things you'd want to teach us, the things you'd want to show us in this specific time and in this, this, uh, these difficult days that we're in, that, Lord, our hearts would be wide open for that. Uh, Lord, would you encourage us? Would you build us up? And would you guide us in, uh, in the ways we can follow you right now? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in, uh, <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter 4, there's a little verse that just says that the Word of God is alive and it's active. The Word of God is alive. The Word of God is active. Uh, that, that little verse, it, it means that no matter what we're going through, no matter what situation we find ourselves in, the Word of God actually has something to say to us. Uh, it's alive. It's, it speaks. It, it speaks into real life, into the real life situations that we find ourselves. Even though the Word of God was written so many years ago, it's still active. It's still alive right now, today, and speaks into all that we're going through right now in our world and in our own lives. As a church, we've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to just continue on with that this morning. 
Well, we're going to just uh, carry on like we normally would be doing. Uh, I'm going to share a message with you this morning. And then next Sunday, Pastor Bruce Lynn is going to have a message for us. He's going to talk to us about the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer might be a good prayer for us these days. Uh, we're going to keep providing these video sermons each week for as long as we need to. And we're going to just trust that God will speak to us through his word. Today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, and, and in, this, in this part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is speaking to those parts of our faith that are often more personal, and, and sometimes we'd even say more private. Um, as Christians, there are ways that our faith in God might be more public, more, more visible, like when we gather together in church, or, or when we're doing things together as a community. Those are things that people can see. Uh, but there are also these ways that our faith is private, that our faith is personal. And, and, and it's in those private and personal places that Jesus is going to focus next in the Sermon on the Mount. So today we're going to focus on what Jesus says about prayer and also what he says about fasting. You know, I can still remember one of the very first times that my son, his name's Riley, one of the first times Riley prayed out loud um, at the dinner table. I can still remember one of the first times he ever did that. He, he was probably only three years old, and he said he wanted to pray. And so we all closed our eyes, and we bowed our heads, and, and our little boy Riley, he started to pray, and he said, Dear Jesus, thank you for my toys and for my cousins. Amen. <laughs> and that was the end of the prayer, and I thought that was a great prayer. I loved it. There is this aspect to prayer that is so simple and so straightforward that even young children, three years old, uh, can understand it. Prayer can be as simple as just saying, God help me, or, or maybe something like, God thank you, or even as simple as just saying, God forgive me. Uh, prayer can be very simple and straightforward, and easy to understand. But there are these other aspects to prayer that are deeply complex, that are, that are mysterious, that are they're even supernatural. People all around the world can be praying to God and, and he hears every single prayer. Now we can pray for people that we've never even met before. Now, prayer can lead to miracles. Prayer can move mountains. Uh, prayer has an impact and a power over spiritual forces and even over demons. Uh, prayer can change our hearts. It can change the hearts of others. Prayer can unite and draw people together. Prayer can bring peace to our minds and to our lives. Prayer can happen anywhere, anytime, and in any situation. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, which we talked about a few weeks ago, Jesus gave us a warning. He said, watch out. Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be, be, to be admired by others for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. Jesus is referring to those parts of our faith that are meant to be private, personal, uh, just between us and God, those parts of our faith. Um, Je uh, Jesus doesn't want us to act like we're, we're, we're doing something for God when we're really just trying to impress people or we're trying to get noticed or admired. Jesus continues on with that thought in Matthew chapter 6 when he starts talking about prayer and then fasting. In Matthew 6, verses 5 and 6, it says, When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself Shut the door behind you and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. Jesus is starting out this, these two verses by, by describing or explaining how, how not to pray. Uh, back then, back in those days, it was, and, and really it still is in many parts of the world, it, 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 it was back then a Jewish custom to pray three different times every day. Uh, in those days, there were certain times of the day when, when everyone would just stop what they were doing and they would pray. Everyone did it. If you were out shopping, if you were doing some errands, 
even if you were just out in your front yard, uh, you would just stop what you were doing and you would pray. This was a regular part of the culture and everyone did it at that time. Morning, afternoon, and evening. And e even though others might see you and when others might see what you're doing, uh, everyone would know that you were praying and that this was meant to be a, actually a very personal and even a very intimate time between you and God, this private, personal uh, time of prayer in the three times in your day. No matter what was going on, you would stop, you would pause, and you would just talk to God in the middle of your day or in the morning or at the end of your day. But over time, some people started to, to use these times of prayer to try to impress people. Uh, they weren't really interested in, in praying. They, they were more interested in making sure that other people noticed them, uh, that other people would maybe admire them and compliment them. You can kind of just imagine someone who was stopping on a street corner at the time of the midday prayer. Uh, they would maybe make a great big scene of putting down their parcels and the things in their hands and, and just getting themselves arranged for their time of prayer. They would gesture and they would speak loudly and make sure other people could hear them. They'd do whatever they could to draw attention so people would turn and look at them. They might even kneel down or bow down or raise up their hands or, or do gestures that would get noticed. Um, they would do whatever they could to make people turn and see them, to see that they were praying. So people would turn and they would look and maybe they'd even be impressed but God wasn't impressed at all. Uh, they might have gotten a compliment from some of the people around them, but they didn't receive any kind of reward from God. That's what Jesus just said. And Jesus, he, when he's describing those kind of people, he doesn't hold back in any way. He calls them hypocrites. They were just like actors. They were pretending. Uh, they were pretending to be something that wasn't actually true. They were doing the right thing, but they were doing it the wrong way. Um, they might have fooled the people around them, but they didn't fool God. He saw right through them. He saw their motives. He saw their hearts. He saw their self-centered desires. And when we read these verses that we just did, and, and we hear what Jesus says, each of us are, are meant to just pause when we read these verses, to just stop and, and to look at our own lives. Because we often do this kind of thing too, don't we? If we're honest this morning, we can all admit that there are times when we like to impress people. There are times when we like to be noticed. We even like to be admired and get compliments from other people. We might act a certain way. We might portray a certain image um, to people that, that we wanted so that we could receive a, a compliment or maybe even receive from praise, some praise from them. These kind of attitudes that Jesus is describing are far from dead. It's not something that was just true many years ago. Uh, if we look at our own lives and we look at our world today, we see that these attitudes are still very much alive and very much well. But this is not the way of Jesus, and, and this behavior doesn't please the Father. It's not pleasing to him. In, instead of seeking after compliments, Instead of seeking after admiration and praise from people, Jesus invites us instead to seek after God. In, instead of trying to impress other people, he wants us to live our lives in a way that is praised and a way that is rewarded by God. Matthew 6, verse 6, Jesus describes this, this different attitude, this different picture of prayer. Uh, let's read that verse again. It just said, but when you pray, but when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. Did you catch how Jesus worded that first part? He said, when you pray, when you pray. He didn't say, if you pray, if you have time to pray. He said, when you pray, for, for Jesus, there's this assumption, there's even an expectation that his followers are people who pray. So he says, when you pray, this is how you should do it. And then he said, when you pray, go away by yourself, 
shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Maybe that sounds familiar to some other things we're hearing. Maybe Jesus was recommending social distancing. Uh, Jesus was talking about social distancing long before the coronavirus. In, In the mind of Jesus, there are spiritual advantages to separating yourself from other people, from other distractions, so that you can be alone with God. Jesus understands that when we get alone with God, we can be more focused on him, we can hear him more clearly. We're less distracted, we're we're not worried about what everyone else around us is thinking or, or all the other things that we're supposed to be doing. We're able to just focus on God. And it's in these private times with God that our faith grows, that our faith is actually formed and shaped in the ways that God would want it to be. Jesus, he he lived this way himself, didn't he? He often withdrew in private in order to be alone with God. He he did this throughout his whole ministry. We read about it all through the Gospels. Our ability to draw near to God and to hear from him is going to be elevated when we can remove distractions, when we can be just alone alone with God. When we slow down, when we stop and when we be still, when we don't rush out the door and rush off to the next thing, when we are alone with God, our faith will grow. And I think we're kind of all in that place right now, aren't we? Uh, Even in this time of isolation and distancing ourselves from others, uh, I think we can all discover that God is with us And he's actually waiting. He's waiting to meet with us in private and in personal ways. That's a good thing. Jesus invites us to pray in private, to withdraw from others, and to find a place where you can draw near to God and meet with him. You know, I know some people who take this verse in a very literal kind of way. If you went and visited their house, you'd find that they have a special room or maybe a special chair or a special part of their house where they just go every day and they pray and they meet with God. There once was this lady, her name was Susanna Wesley. Uh, She lived back in the early 1700s, many years ago. But Susanna Wesley, she was a pastor's wife and she was actually the mother of 10 children. The mother of 10 children. How does a mother of 10 children find a quiet place in her house to pray? It's impossible, isn't it? Well, everywhere she tried to go to pray, her kids would find her. They'd come in and need her, need, need her to pay attention to them. So, so she came up with her own solution. Uh, when Susanna Wesley needed to pray, when she needed to talk to God and, and meet with him, she would just sit down on a chair in her kitchen, at, at her kitchen table, and she would pull up her cooking apron and pull it all the way over her head. Her cooking apron that she was wearing, she'd pull it up over her head. And all ten children knew that if mom's apron was up over her head, she was not to be disturbed. She was meeting with God. She was talking to God and listening to God. And that time spent with God each day underneath her apron became the place where her faith was able to grow, where she could pray. She prayed for her family. She prayed for her marriage. She prayed for her husband. She prayed for her church, for her neighbors, and for her community. Uh, all while she was just sitting at her kitchen table with her kitchen apron uh, pulled up over her head. You know, two of, two of those 10 children were John Wesley and Charles Wesley. And John Wesley and Charles Wesley, those two boys grew up and, and, and they had an incredible impact for God in their lives. Uh, those two men, they, they preached to over a million people. They, they wrote hymns that we are still singing in our church today. The Lord answered a lot of their mom's prayers when she was hiding (laughs) under her kitchen apron uh, at the table. She created her own little tent where she could meet with the Lord. I love that story. So Jesus, he's inviting us to eliminate all distractions, to, to separate ourselves from other people, from all the things that we're busy and focused on, so that we can focus on God. This time that we're in right now, this time of quarantine or social distancing, it's it's not easy for us, is it? But it has given all of us an opportunity 
to draw near to God right now, to hear from him, to worship him, to give him our heavy burdens, and to find strength in his presence. We can't be with each other right now, but we can be with God. We can meet with him in the ways that Jesus is describing, and God is waiting to meet with us. If there was ever a time to pray, it's now, isn't it? Uh, you need prayer. Uh, you need to be someone who's praying, talking to God right now. We need prayer. I need prayer. We all need prayer. Our whole world needs prayer right now. Let's be a praying church, Bethel. Let's pray. Let's pray more than we ever have before. Now, these verses that I just read and this description of prayer that Jesus is giving, it doesn't mean that we should never gather together to pray, or we should never pray in more public ways or when other people can see us. That's, that's not quite what Jesus is saying here. Um, the early church was devoted and committed to praying together. Now, and we are instructed to pray together, to, to pray with one another. Uh, prayer, is, prayer is this thing that is always seen and unseen. <clears throat> prayer is seen and also unseen. We pray privately in these unseen kind of ways, but we also pray together with others in ways that are, that are seen, that are visible. We pray in ways that are seen and unseen, and both of those are important. Well, I want to shift over to verses 16 to 18 for a few minutes with you. Jesus is going to speak in this next part of the Sermon on the Mount um, about a topic that we probably don't really talk about that often. He wants to talk about fasting, fasting from food. And so we're going to read just a few verses there. Just take a few minutes on these verses. Verse, verses 16 to 18 in Matthew 6 say, And when you fast, don't make it obvious, as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled, so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth that that is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair, wash your face. Then no one will notice that you're fasting except your father, who knows what you do in private, and your father, who sees everything, will reward you. You might not have heard a lot about fasting before. It's, it's probably not something we talk about at our church as often as we should. But, but, but back then, fasting was a regular part of the culture of the Jewish culture at that time. The, the Pharisees, they fasted twice a week. Uh, on Mondays and on Thursdays, they wouldn't eat any food all day long. Uh, John the Baptist, when you read about him, he fasted regularly. Even Jesus himself fasted for 40 days and went 40 days without food. Many Christians all around the world in our world today still fast, and that's a, a regular practice, a regular discipline. A uh, way that they uh, obey and, and commit themselves to the Lord. Fasting is, is it's, it's a voluntary kind of choice to avoid eating regular meals or, or even several meals. You can fast for part of a day and just skip a meal, or a full day, or even several days. Most of the time, people fasted from food, but you can also fast from other things too, from other activities from other things that are a regular part of your life. There are several different reasons why someone would choose to fast. Uh, some, some things that they would want maybe to, to express to the Lord or some things they'd want to see happen in their own hearts. That's why they would choose to fast. Here's a few of the reasons why, why someone would choose to fast. They, they might fast in order to grow in, in self-control and in discipline. People might fast in order to seek repentance and forgiveness from sin. Uh, fasting and, and repentance are often connected in Scripture. They would fast to just be with God, to, to draw near to Him without distractions, to acknowledge their dependence on God, how they depend and rely on God more than anything else. Um, people would fast in order to prepare for a significant event or maybe a significant decision that they're just needing the Lord's help and the Lord's guidance with. Some people choose to fast in order to identify themselves with the hungry or with the undernourished who are in our world, to kind of live like they do, to live in their shoes, and to understand that we're all connected as brothers and sisters in Christ. 
The whole idea behind fasting is that you're choosing to set aside food or a meal in order to be with God. You're setting aside something that, something that literally fills you up in order to be more filled, to be filled up with God instead. When you fast, you are, you are recognizing your need to depend on God more than anything else in your life, even more than food. Jesus, he began verse 16 that we just read by saying what he's been saying a few times, when you fast. For Jesus, there's this assumption, this expectation that his followers are fasting. This past week, when I was doing some reading on fasting, I, I read that I read someone who said that this passage on fasting in, in this part of the Sermon on the Mount, this might be the most ignored part the most ignored section in the entire Sermon on the Mount. And I just need to admit, I used to fast more often. It used to be a fairly regular thing in my life. But it's been several years since I can remember doing that. Uh, for many of us, uh, this spiritual practice, the spiritual discipline of fasting is quite unfamiliar to us. It's maybe something we've never done or, or we've done it very rarely. Um, fasting has an important purpose. The purpose of fasting is to remind us of our reliance on God in all things, in every part of our lives. It reminds us that Jesus is the one who satisfies and nourishes and provides what we need. Fasting is this way to place God uh, on the throne of our lives, uh, in the highest place, to make him the first priority. And we submit our will and we submit our lives to him. Fasting is a way to place God as our, as our first priority, our first love. Communicate that to him again. Fasting and prayer, they are almost always connected to each other. When you fast, it's so that you can pray. When you, it's when you, when you fast, you, you want to draw near to God. You want to hear from him. You want to talk to him. You want to meet with him. Um, I don't know about you. Well, when you look at all that's happened over this last week or last couple of weeks, doesn't it kind of feel to you like we are all doing some fasting right now? Um, with all that's happened over these last few days, we've all had things that have been taken away, things that were, are removed, those things that we used to rely on and depend on, uh, they've been set aside. Many of the things that used to fill up our lives are no longer there. And we're feeling kind of empty right now, aren't we? Do you think that maybe God might be trying to get our attention right now? Do you think he's seeing if we are going to depend and rely on him, if we're going to trust in him, even during these difficult days? When we're fasting, Jesus doesn't want us to draw a lot of attention to ourselves. Now, back then, some people that Jesus described here in these verses Back then, there were some people who would do, who, they wanted everyone to notice how hard and how difficult it was to, to fast and to miss some meals. So their hair was messed up, <clears throat> their faces were pale, they looked miserable. They wanted sympathy and pity, uh, they wanted attention, they wanted praise. They were acting as if obeying God was some kind of a punishment. Um, Obeying God should never look like punishment. When you're fasting, Jesus says, wash your face, comb your hair, look your best. Uh, don't worry if others are going to notice that you're fasting or not, because God notices. And worry about that. Make sure that you're doing it so that he'll see you. What you're doing is good, and it, it pleases God. So don't act like it's some kind of a punishment to depend on God or to obey God, because it's not. It's a good thing. It pleases our Father. You might ask yourself the question, is fasting a command of God? Uh, is, if we don't fast, are we committing a sin? If I haven't fasted, am I sinning before God? I would just say this, that fasting is it's not a command of God. But it is something that God values. It is something God rewards. Fasting is something that's modeled for us throughout all of Scripture. 
uh, even by Jesus himself. Fasting, when you try it, when you do it, uh, fasting can be a rich and a beautiful experience in our walk and in our relationship with God. It was about a year ago that I was in a class with a whole bunch of seminary students, and we were talking about this passage. And I remember one of the guys in our class, he, he told us that he had done two different kinds of fasts uh, fairly recently, and he was telling us about those. Uh, the first, on the first fast, he fasted from his phone, from his cell phone, from any type of technology for 36 hours. And then a few days later, he fasted from food for 36 hours as well. Um, can you guess which one he said was harder? <laughs> you could probably guess. He said he struggled a lot without his phone, without any technology. He said those 36 hours were really hard. He was really struggling. Uh, and in comparison, he said he found it fairly easy to go without food, to fast from food uh, for the same amount of time to spend that time with the Lord. That's uh, pretty interesting, isn't it? Um, before we finish off, there's one warning, one warning that I, I just want to quickly mention when it comes to fasting. Uh, fasting can sometimes be a way that we try to attempt to manipulate God in some ways, you know, where we try to get what we want from God. When we fast, we, we can sometimes have this attitude in our minds that we're trying to bargain a little bit with God. We can kind of say to him, well, if I go without food for 24 hours, then that means that you, God, you have to do what I want. If I fast, then that means that God owes me something. That means God's going to give me what it is that I want. And that's not how it works. When we fast, we submit our lives, we submit our wills and our desires, our needs, our hopes. We, we submit our lives all to him, all to him. And we say, I depend on you more than I depend on anything else. It kind of feels like we're fasting right now. There are many things that filled up our lives even just a few weeks ago, and a lot of that has been put to the side right now. We depended on a lot of things every day, but maybe in the midst of life a few weeks ago, we'd actually kind of forgotten what it means to truly and, and sincerely to depend on God. So instead of filling our lives with all that other stuff, I think we're being invited right now in this time, this challenging time, to fill our lives with God, to fill our lives with his love, with his grace, with his power, to fill our lives with the goodness of God, to, to fill our lives with the fruit of the Spirit, his self-control and patience and joy and all of these things that he offers to us. You know, I can't see you today. I wish I could. I wish we were all gathered here in a church like we usually are. I, I can't see you today. But God sees you. Uh, these verses just said that, that God sees everything. And he sees you today. He's with you. He wants to meet with you. He wants you to know that you can depend on him and that you can rely on him for all that you need right now. Isn't that good? God wants you to know that. He's waiting to meet with you. We're going to put some discussion questions where you can get your hands on them. And I want to just encourage you now, uh, as we're going to end our service in a few minutes, I'm going to encourage you to just... Uh, with the people around you, take some time to work through those discussion questions like we would do if we were all here together. Just take a few minutes and share together, and uh, I, I trust that'll be a good time for you to just respond and, and interact with God's Word and the things that you've heard from me today. God bless you. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to finish off our service. Let's pray together. Lord, these verses that we just read, they are really these verses of, of invitation, where you are inviting us to meet with you in these very specific and really important ways. Lord, we want to be people of prayer right now. Our world needs prayer. We need prayer. Our church needs prayer. Our community and our neighbors, they need prayer. Lord, would you help us to find some private, quiet places in the midst of our day to reach out to you, to, 
speak with you, to listen to you, to be with you. Thank you for the way that you are waiting to meet with us in those ways. Pray that, that this time would be a time where our faith grows, where our faith is formed in some new ways, where some of those other distractions are pushed away. And Lord, when it comes to fasting, I think we all kind of feel a little bit empty right now. Those things that filled our lives have been taken from us, and we're feeling a bit empty. And so I pray that we would turn to you right now and understand the ways that we can depend and rely on you above everything else. That even in this situation with so much uncertainty, with so many questions, and even those times when we feel afraid, that we know that we can depend and trust in God, that you are in control. And I pray that this time would, would be, be maybe a reminder of that in ways that we all need. That we wouldn't resist it, but instead we would, we would look forward to these ways that we can meet with you. Thank you, Lord, for Bethel Church. I pray that you'd be with each person in our church, no matter where they are today, in their homes, uh, even if they're wearing their pajamas at church. Lord, that you'd bless them and watch over them, that you'd make your face shine upon them, and that you'd give them peace in this situation that we all find ourselves in. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.